Leningrad, second city of Russia, until the communist revolution, the capital. A city of history and beauty. Leningraders love their city and they're proud of its title, the hero city. The title was given for what they suffered in the Second World War. But talk to men and women who survived those years and they will tell you that Leningraders didn't think of themselves as heroes. Suffering that now seems beyond human endurance was then a daily routine. Midday, June the 22nd, 1941. Leningraders gather around the radios and loudspeakers of the city's public address system to hear the foreign minister, Molotov, broadcast to the nation. They are told that Hitler has launched an attack during the night and that Russia is at war with yesterday's ally, Nazi Germany. German troops had advanced deep into Russia, and most of the Red Air Force had been destroyed before it could even take off. Hitler said that his master plan, Operation Barbarossa, would make the world hold its breath. His soldiers would give the final proof of the superiority of Nazism by overthrowing communism in less than six months. His armies were to capture Stalingrad, Moscow, and Leningrad. Leningrad was a great seaport and industrial center, but above all, the city was a birthplace of Russian communism. Leningraders reacted with instinctive patriotism. For them, it wasn't a struggle between ideologies. It was an attack on their country and their city. Men marched away to protect homes and families, but also to do something more, to defend Leningrad, the city which no one had been able to capture since its foundation by Peter the Great. As St. Petersburg, it had been Russia's capital for over 200 years, the spearhead of her advance to Western civilization. Renamed Leningrad after the revolution, it was not only the city of czars and palaces, of Lenin and communism, but the home of Russian poetry and music, ballet, literature. Every Leningrader, communist and non-communist alike, shared the same fierce local pride. A pride so deep it was almost a faith. In only 16 days, the German tanks had advanced 300 miles. One million people were rushed out of Leningrad to build tank traps and fortifications. Today we have dug defenses for 16 hours. It is bitterly cold and I have only thin dresses. We stand up to our ankles in water and my feet bleed terribly. I'm afraid I shall never dance again. We've worked for 18 days without a break, 12 hours a day, and I'm 57. The soil is so hard, one has to work with a pick. The dry clay is as hard as rock. It was no use. The German armies swept over the trenches and their defenders. During August 1941, the tanks came to within 20 miles of the city, while to the north, Russia's old enemy Finland had started to close in as well. Leningrad now prepared for the defense of the city itself. And, uh, for instance, every corner 
of our streets was turned into a, how to say, the defensive um, point. All the windows were bricked. And, uh, you know, people was ready to meet Germans in the streets of Leningrad. 300,000 civilians joined the People's Militia to fight for the city street by street. Workers marched to their factories armed, ready for when the moment came. There was martial law, a curfew from 10 at night until 5 in the morning, restrictions on movement, spot checks on passes, severe penalties for rumour mongers and defeatists. In the strained atmosphere, the city became full of suspicion. Tram conductors even gave up calling out the names of stops for fear of giving information to spies. Private radios and telephones were banned. Fighting was now going on in the southern suburbs. The resistance to the Russians surprised the Germans, who had thought that the people would want to be freed from a communist dictatorship. Nevertheless, the advance continued, and on September the 8th, 1941, the Germans reached the shores of Lake Ladiga. Leningrad was surrounded, cut off from the rest of Russia. To the north, the Finnish army, securely dug in amongst the endless forests and wastes stretching away into the Arctic. The possibility of help from the north completely cut off. To the west, the sea blocked by German and Finnish shore batteries and U-boats. The Red Fleet was trapped in its Leningrad base. The sea route in and out of the city was closed. To the south and east, the German army still pressed in on the city. Already they had cut the railway connecting Leningrad with Moscow and the rest of Russia. Finally, to the northeast, the waters of Lake Ladiga, as wide as the English Channel and surrounded by uninhabited forest and swamp. Leningrad was encircled. Like all modern cities, it couldn't support itself. Life depended upon supplies from outside. Three million people trapped in a stranglehold, cut off without even emergency stockpiles of food or fuel. The world waited for Leningrad to fall. The Germans looked down on the city, only seven miles from the center now. Hitler had invitations printed for the celebration banquet to be held in the main hotel. But the Russians were going to make Hitler fight for the city. For Stalin, the country seemed to face defeat, so Leningrad will be defended no matter what the cost in lives. The city waited for the attack to begin. Leningrad knew what to expect, the familiar pattern which Hitler had used to crush city after city across Europe. Huge air raids to weaken the defences and terror bombing to demoralise the population, followed at the right psychological moment by the crushing advance of the tanks. <laughs> 
air raids were almost continuous. The Germans had subjected only London to heavier bombing. Leningraders had read how London survived. We watched like pupils waiting for an examination. But London hadn't been surrounded by Nazi tanks and artillery. But the bombing didn't produce the panic that it had in many other cities, nor the readiness to accept defeat. Between attacks, the city's vast public address system broadcast patriotic songs. Relayed into every street, home and workshop by the thousands of loudspeakers, defiant music echoed the determination of the people. Crowded together in air raid shelters and helping in rescue work, they drew strength and hope from each other and from any small victory that came their way. Crowds formed around the first German plane to be shot down over the city. Under the common danger, people drew closer together. The three million surrounded Leningraders became like one huge family. The Germans bombed round the clock. In the factories, the people worked round the clock to keep the city's defences supplied with arms. They were glad to work the long hours. They felt they were hitting back. But the situation was getting desperate. Damaged factories were running out of raw materials, and often there was no electricity because the power stations had been hit. October 1941, the first snow. Leningrad still held out, but Hitler had decided to change his tactics. Many of the troops attacking Leningrad were moved to strengthen the drive on Moscow, and those that remained dug themselves in to wait for Leningrad to collapse. Hitler was convinced that it was only a matter of time before the city must fall into his hands. Cut off from supplies, the people would come out and surrender. They couldn't continue to resist once they'd begun to starve. Stalin ordered Dmitry Pavlov to take charge of Leningrad's food supplies. There was enough bread for 30 days, sugar and fats for about 60 days. It was decided to put everyone on rations, both troops and civilians. The siege began to look like a long term. The winter of 1941 grew colder, the worst for over a hundred years. It was not just a question of staying alive, but of staying strong enough to resist the Germans. The last reserves of food and fuel were draining away. Rations were reduced again and again. Some way had to be found to supply the city or it would die. The only way in was by air. Slow twin engine planes dodging low over the enemy lines. But with Russia on the verge of military disaster, only 60 planes could be spared. However many trips they made, they could only bring in 45 tons of supplies a day. The minimum needed to stay alive was 2,000 tons a day. 60 planes could not feed and supply 3 million people. By November, people were eating their pets, dogs and cats. Children were scraping under the snow for leaves or scavenging for animal foods. Shdanov, secretary of the Leningrad Party Committee, had to find a solution. The only possible supply route was across Lake Ladiga. The distance across the lake was 18 miles. Because of the severe cold, it had frozen. <laughs> 
and on November the 18th, a man was sent out on horseback to see if he could get to the other side. He succeeded. There was a small break in the circle. Stjarnov ordered a road to be built. 18 miles across the ice would be difficult enough, but the whole distance out of Leningrad, up to the lake and over frozen, uncharted wastes on the other side to the nearest railway line to Moscow and the rest of Russia, was 237 miles, further than from London to Paris. It seemed impossible, but it had to be tried. The surface of the ice was uneven, deep crevasses and huge piles of ice whipped into ridges by the violent storms. The labor force of thousands was given 15 days to build the road. The hungry men were paid in food in lieu of wages. Just five days later, the first lorries were crossing, often only carrying half loads because of the danger of sinking through the thin ice. There was a link. They called it the road of life. On the first day, the lorries brought in 33 tons. To survive at all, the Leningraders needed 100 times this much. There was less than seven days flour left. Food shops were closed and bread was distributed from stores in each district or at work. The ration was reduced to 10 slices of bread for workers and five slices for others. We divided the ration into three pieces for breakfast, lunch and dinner. The children break theirs into microscopically small fragments which they hide in matchboxes. Everyone went hungry. First this, it just hurts, like something um, cuts you. <laughs> and then it also very, um, how to say, uh, dull, dull pain, you see, continuous pain. The ration was three times below starvation level. In laboratories, Scientists fought to find ways of making food go further. They discovered substitutes and additives. They invented new foods. The flour lasted longer because bread was made of 10% oil cake, 10% cellulose, 20% dust beaten from old flour sacks, 2% wallpaper paste, and the rest corn and rye meal. Soya beans made milk. Soup could be made from sheep gut found in the docks and even processed industrial grease or bark from trees. One day I was walking down the street. It was snow covered, nothing unusual. But on my way back, I saw a corpse sitting there frozen. I was horribly frightened. In the houses, there was electricity for only an hour or two each day. It was needed for the factories. Public transport stopped. Weakened people had to walk everywhere, even to collect their rations, and they could never get warm. The temperature was 30 degrees below zero. Outside, the Germans suffered from the cold too. They had expected to take Leningrad in the autumn and therefore weren't prepared for a Russian winter. To speed up the city's surrender, they moved guns onto the hills and shelled it. Even now, finding the strength to stay alive was not enough. People had to find the energy to work. In battered factories, shortages of power and materials had to be overcome. The front line must still be supplied with arms and ammunition if the Germans were to be kept out. Our factory, the Kirov, was hit by 5,000 shells. A thousand people died. The ambulance brigade picked up the dead and wounded, spread sand on the floor, and the rest of us carried on with the job. Our hours were reduced from 10 to 8, and beds were provided in shelters to preserve our energy. Workers who were ill at home were brought to the factory dispensary by sleigh. We had all our windows blown out by a bomb, and I thought to myself, now we really can't go on. <laughs> 
not till spring. We can't go on almost without food. And yet somehow we didn't stop. And sure enough, within six hours, we were working again. Working in altogether hellish conditions, with eight degrees of frost in the workshop, 14 degrees in the office, and no heat. One of the masters of us, one of the masters of us, was so slow. One of our foremen in the factory had got so weak, you could say that about every one of us, we were in a pretty bad state. This foreman couldn't supervise the repairs of tanks, and of course there were some young lads who needed some guidance. So they lashed him onto the bench with ropes as his legs wouldn't support him, and he sat there and supervised the repair work. Apart from there being no food, the frosts were very severe and there was no central heating. We were burning furniture, books. We were tearing down the old wooden houses to burn. But all this fuel was quickly used up. For a city like Leningrad, you need 120 train loads of firewood in one day in that kind of weather. And we could only bring in two train loads for everything, including the bread factories and armament factories and the hospitals. So basically, the town wasn't heated. People were freezing to death. By the end of November 1941, the hunger was so intense that people tried to eat leather, boil bars of carpenter's glue to spread on their tiny pieces of bread. 11,000 Leningraders had starved and frozen to death in one month. Some hid the corpses of relatives to keep their ration books. A few went mad and ate the dead flesh. The number of deaths was going up each day. December 1941. Even the soldiers defending Leningrad were starving. If something was not done, the city would be lost. All the available men and materials were moved up to try and break through the circle in a simultaneous attack from inside and outside. The city waited for news. Forces inside Leningrad made no progress, but the Russian army from outside pushed towards the city. It couldn't break through, but the advance was enough to build a new railway up to Lake Ladiga. The length of the road of life was halved, and supplying Leningrad made easier. On the lake, the drivers were pressed to do two trips a day, then three, then four. And now the lorries were used not only to bring food in, but to take hungry people out. Empty lorries and buses returning across the ice for more supplies carried evacuees. Although many of those detailed to leave the city refused, they felt that leaving was desertion. And thousands of those who set out never reached the other side. Already starving and weakened, the journey in temperatures of 40 degrees below zero was too much for them. Yet despite this and repeated German bombing, tens of thousands reached safety. Better weather conditions and on the primitive road surface, 1,000 trucks were smashed or lost. The petrol was so poor that the drivers had to filter it through cloth before putting it in their tanks. They lost their way in blizzards. Many were drowned when their lorries fell through holes in the ice. They fell asleep at the wheel from hunger and exhaustion. But the amount of supplies getting in crept steadily up. On December the 25th, 1941, a first small increase was made in the ration, a gamble with no reserve to back it. It was still not enough to live on, but the morale effect on the people was enormous. At the front, there was stalemate. The Russians waited, hoping to become strong enough to attack. The Germans waited, hoping for Leningrad to collapse from cold and hunger. For the present, it was the determination of the Leningraders which was going to decide the outcome, not the opposing armies. Rations had been increased, but they were still below starvation level, while the cold was more intense than ever. <laughs> 
the number of deaths was going up and up. From 11,000 in November 1941, to 50,000 in December, to 100,000 in January 1942. Bodies starved beyond a certain point will die, even if food does come. Almost the only thing that hadn't stopped was the public address system. For starving people alone in cold, dark rooms, it was often the only contact with life. Pouring out music, poetry, instructions, news. It echoed round the frozen streets. It never stopped. January 1942, no one expected to survive. When parting, friends always wished each other a final farewell. There were now so many corpses in the streets that people no longer took any notice of them. Yet there was no looting, no riots, and no appeal for a surrender. Broadcasters ran out of music or became too weak and hungry to perform. Then the loudspeakers played the sound of a metronome. Anything rather than silence. Silence meant death. I remember our children. You see, they looked like old men. And if they would see a bright toy or a small piece of bread, they would prefer to take a piece of bread. There was one occasion when I received 300 grams of meat for three people. I went into the shed to cut up some firewood with my mother, and when I came back, it was gone. My eldest son had eaten it raw, and there was nothing to cook. I shall never forget it. When I got very weak, I couldn't move anymore. They brought me to bed. They started to undress me, but they couldn't get my boots off. They had to cut them off. You would get up in the mornings and see crowds of people in the streets coming from work or going to work and dying in their tracks and freezing solid. The corpses would be collected in lorries and taken to the cemetery. We weren't strong enough to actually dig the earth, so we would use explosives to make large pits and put the corpses in this collective grave. Even the metronome stopped. The city held its breath. After three hours, the ticking started again. Alone in a room, rescuers found a small girl called Tanya Savage. She was so weak that they couldn't save her. Close by her was a notebook in which she had kept a diary. Jenny died on December 28, 1941, at 12.30. 
grandmother died on January the 25th, Lena died on March 17th. Uncle Leisha died on May 10th at 4 p.m. May 13th at 7.30, darling Mama died. The savages are all dead. They all died. There is only me left. February 1942, the death rate was still rising, as many as 10,000 a day. Yet life didn't stop. Composers still wrote music. Professors still researched in the libraries. The writers even held a conference. They were so cold they had to burn the chairs they sat on, but they held their conference. People who kept up their work continued their interests, seemed to survive longer than those who stayed at home in bed to keep warm and preserve their strength. The dying order was first the very old and the very young, then the men, and last the women. The city's musical comedy theatre remained open, even though the artists often collapsed from hunger when they left the stage. Before you went onto the stage, you were just an ordinary person, exhausted and hungry from lack of sleep and food. But when you saw the audience waiting for something from you, you felt transformed and danced and sang just as joyfully and gaily as we had before the war. It was as necessary for the audience as bread. At last, in March 1942, came the first signs of warmer weather. But the spring brought new dangers. The ice on the lake was melting, the road of life would be cut. The lorries crossed faster and faster until the last safe moment. And there was a threat of epidemics. Dead bodies revealed under the melting snow, uncleared refuse festering in the moist warm air, polluted water from cracked pipes and mains. A big cleansing campaign was organized to prevent outbreaks of typhoid, dysentery and pneumonia in an already weakened population. It was like trying to clean up the North Pole covered with garbage. There were housewives and school children and educated people, professors, doctors, musicians, old men and women. One turned out with a crowbar, another with a child's sledge. April the 15th, 1942. 3,000 staff people die. Heavy lorries stop crossing the lake. But a tram runs in the city. People who saw it wept with joy. It was the first tram to run in Leningrad for four months. <laughs> 
That tram seemed to be the first real sign that the city could come back to life. It meant power in the cables, fresh strength in people's hearts. They started to repair the houses and to build new supply routes. They turned the ice road into the water road. In May 1942, the boats were bringing in more supplies than ever before. Food rations had been increased, yet thousands were still dying from the effects of the winter's starvation. It was decided that everyone strong enough to travel would be evacuated. If possible, only soldiers and workers would be left in the city. Fresh troops were brought in to strengthen the weary garrison. front, the military stalemate continued. Although the build-up went on, the Russians were still not strong enough to attack. The siege was to continue. A massive campaign was organized to restore the physical fitness of the one million people who now remained in the city. They needed not only food, but exercise to revive withered muscles and bring dried out joints back into use. Commentaries on the matches in the football competitions were even broadcast to the German lines to taunt them with their failure to subdue the city. Outside Leningrad, there were many wooden houses, and those houses were disassembled and shared between Leningradians. But not a single tree in our parks and in our gardens was cut down. It was like kill a, um, you know, human being. However, they cut as much wood as they could from the forests immediately outside the city. 3,000 women were organized to lay in timber for the coming winter. There was to be no repetition of 1941. There was also peat in the marshy ground close to the city, which had not been thought worth using before the war. Although under the noses of the enemy guns, it was dug up and stockpiled. Vegetables were grown in every available plot of land. Each family was issued with a siege gardening handbook. Vitamin deficiency had been one of the worst effects of the food shortage. To counteract scurvy, Leningraders still had to take a drink made by pouring hot water on pine needles. The city was becoming steadily stronger even if shrapnel had to be removed from cabbages before they could be eaten. By the autumn of 1942, nearly everybody left in the city had been organized and trained to play an active role in its defense. The physical strength had been built up, and the morale was higher than ever before. Leningrad waited for the winter. It was now a fortress, a fortress it should have been a year before. On January the 12th, 1943, the Russians were at last ready to begin the long-awaited attack intended to free Leningrad. As the troops waited to move forward, news was brought round of the decisive Russian victory at Stalingrad. It seemed a good omen. Again, the plan was to attack simultaneously from inside and outside. Only six days later, on January the 18th, 1943, 
the people heard that the first part of the plan had been successful. The two armies had met. Immediately, a railway line linking the city with Moscow and the rest of Russia was built through the six-mile-wide corridor that had been opened. The second part of the plan was for the two armies to drive south and swing the enemy right away from Leningrad. But the Germans fought back stubbornly. Nevertheless, the first train passed through the corridor, although bitter fighting was still going on only a few miles away. Cheering crowds welcomed its arrival, certain that their long struggle was over. But it wasn't. By the spring of 1943, the German heavy guns still overlooked Leningrad. They launched a heavier artillery bombardment than ever before. Dividing the city into squares, they shelled each area methodically. Thousands of shells were concentrated on residential areas each day. A fifth of the city's houses were destroyed. Peak shelling times were morning and evening rush hours when most people were exposed out of doors. The people became bitter and disillusioned. After all they had been through, it was hard to find reserves of strength and determination. The suffering should have been over, and now it wasn't. During the summer of 1943, the songs on the loudspeakers still spoke with the people's love of the city. The Leningraders were tired, but they responded as they had before. Any bitterness was still not as strong as their resentment against the Germans. Each street had a this side of the street during shelling notice painted up on it. Because the Germans were shelling from the south, the south side of the streets, protected by the high walls and buildings, were always safest. Only the few thousand schoolchildren were hurried to shelter during alerts. Other people were so used to bombardment by now that they carried on as normal, risking the shell bursts and shrapnel. By the end of 1943, 16,000 people had been killed by the shelling and 33,000 injured. Leningrad was waiting for the day when it would hit back. Although only just over half of the city's workers were left and only one third of the machines, the output of tanks, guns and shells went up and up. In taking this medal, I remember my father who worked here for 20 years. He taught many apprentices, me among them. My father's life has been stopped by a fascist bomb. For the death of my father and the destruction of Leningrad, I give my oath to have revenge through work and help for the front, and if need be, by fighting to defend Leningrad. January the 14th, 1944, the great Russian attack began. The aim was simple, to drive the Germans away from Leningrad along the entire front. 
excited people came out to watch. after the attack had started, this announcement was made. In the course of the fighting, a task of historic importance has been achieved. The city of Leningrad has been completely freed from the enemy's blockade and from the enemy's barbarous artillery fire. The German retreat was only going to end in Berlin. Prisoners shuffled through the city into the prisoner of war camps. The only German soldiers the people had seen. January the 27th, 1944, Leningrad was at last able to celebrate its release. The siege had lasted 900 days. People uh, never met each other, they kissed each other and cried. It, it meant for us that we were born <laughs> again for the second time. The official figure for the number who had died was given as 632,000. Later estimates have put it at over one million, one person in three. Ordinary civilians caught up in a war not of their making, but ordinary civilians who chose to starve to death rather than surrender. After the war, Leningrad itself was proclaimed a hero city of the Soviet Union. The word hero may seem inappropriate or inadequate, but it's hard to find a better. And one more peculiar uh, thing about cleaning gradients. They never cried. And as poet as Olga Bergoltz said, that tears frozen out on the faces of Lenin gradients. They never cried. Uh, uh, when they found their dwellings destroyed, when they buried their dear relatives, children and parents. Первые 
пути Открывать сто причин Почему мы сердце отдали ему В круг его оград мы входим Как дом друга Долгут завистники Что город наш угрюм Он любому, кто пришел Слово доброе нашел И прошедшее, как сказку, развернул Петербурга стройки первые на топях И победное движение россиян Шум октябрьских колонн Блокады черный напряжен Ленинград геройской славы воссиял.